Oh, I guess I should, meh, that's fine. Done is done. Uh, okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen and then we will get started. That's my calendar. This is my presentation. Hello, I clicked you. Ah! No. Oh, what's that? Okay. There we go. Okay. Ta da! Title screen. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. We are talking about dominance theory today. So, super fun times for everyone, I'm sure. Here we go. Um, so, let's dive right into it. I said, let's dive right into it. Oh my God. Thank you. Um, so what is dominance theory? Uh, in short, it is a theory that animals misbehave or act out because they are trying to be in control of whatever situation they're in. Um, and that if you as the human and you know, the supposed pack leader exert your dominance as alpha over the rest of your pack, which would be your animals, you will gain control of your animal and they will not misbehave and they will be perfect all the time. Um, so, ah. Oh God, I can't let people in. Are you able to let people in? Okay. Can you give me host and I'll do that while you're talking? Yes. Let me admit her. Then oh wait, but if you give me host, then you can't share. So if you're, unfortunately, if you're the host and you're sharing your screen, then you're gonna have to admit people. Okay, we'll make it work. Sorry. Come on, computer. I think uh, internet at the shelter is not like super great. So this is gonna be fun and tricky. Oh, see, that works. That one actually popped up on my screen. Okay. Um, all right, so anyway, um, so dominance theory was pretty much popularized in the 70s. It was based on a few different works, but one of the primary ones that people kind of caught on to was by Dr. David Meech, um, which I had to look that up because I was definitely talking to him, calling him Dr. Mech. But it is Meech. Um, so he did some, I guess, research studies in the 60s and 70s and wrote a book. Um, since then, because that was like, what, 50 years ago, he has updated his viewpoint uh, based on more studies he has done. Um, but then also dominant theory was further popularized by Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer. Ignore the fact that I spelled his name right, wrong right there. Um, but we'll talk more about that later. That, that really brought it into like pop culture and made it super popular. And any day now, computer. Any day now. Thank you. Okay, so, but what is dominance? Because this whole theory rests on like the dominance of animals. Pop, sorry, contrary to popular belief, dominance is a relationship between individual animals. It is not a behavior. You cannot exhibit, like you cannot just be dominant on your own. It is about a relationship. Um, it is a way to establish hierarchy between animals in order to decide who has priority access to the resources that you need, like food, resting place, choice of mate, blah, blah, blah. Fun side fact, uh, some species in the wild, not every male gets a chance to mate with females. Like some males don't even pass on their genetic whatever um, because they just don't get the chance to mate with females, whereas dominant males will mate with many different females and like spread that genetics all over the place. 
Uh, dogs have evolved over the last, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 years, whatever, uh, depending on what you subscribe to in terms of their evolution. Um, but over the last few millennia, when we've been domesticating them and stuff and breeding them and making them into what we want them to be, they have become quite promiscuous. So you are all living with some hoes. Um, and the need to prioritize who gets to mate is just not there because like, dude, girl dogs be getting knocked up by like two or three different dogs. So that whole thing was taken out of the equation which is not necessarily uh, important here, but I thought it was a fun side fact and wanted to share it with you. Um, come on. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the origins of dominance theory. Um, so the monks of New Skeet, which I have no idea what that is. I literally just heard about it yesterday, but I love the name. Um, but they wrote a book in the 1970s called How to Be Your Dog's Best Friend. Uh, and it basically recommended that people use the alpha role on dogs. I'm sure we've all kind of seen this if we don't actually know what it's called. Um, but basically it's where you roll a dog on its back and pin it down until it displays submissive behaviors. Um, and that way, like you do that whenever it displays some kind of undesired behavior and that's supposed to like fix it. Uh, this practice was used because it was observed in captive wolves in studies done in the 60s. Um, so it's pretty important to a note there that like um, this dominance and the alpha role that they were basing all of this off of um, was displayed by wolves that were not wild. So they were not in their natural like hierarchy pack thing. Um, they were captive packs or like, oh, what do we call it? An artificial pack. So like they're not, it is not naturally occurring. It was man-made basically. Um, in 1999, Dr. David Meech actually recanted his position on alphas and dominance because he observed that the dominance displays, the alpha roles, all that, um, and like wolves emerging as an alpha over the whole pack occurred in these captive packs, but the wolves that were living in the wild in more natural settings were not doing that. Um, wolves in the wild tended to have pack structures that involved one wolf or a pair of wolves, um, so like a mom and a dad wolf, being more dominant in terms of resource priority because, because the rest of the pack is their children. Um, so it's more like a family unit than a pack. And so the parents just kind of naturally end up on top and the kids end up on bottom. And then when it's mating time, of course, the parents are going to do the mating and the kids are hopefully not watching, but you know, they're wolves, who cares? Um, but I thought maybe Dr. Meech could explain this a little bit better. Eventually. He'll get there. He's thinking about it, checking his notes. Hey, we're getting there. Uh, the term alpha is, um, it isn't really accurate when uh, describing most of the um, leaders of, of wolf packs uh, because uh, it implies, the term implies uh, that uh, the wolves fought and um, competed strongly to get to the top of the pack. In actuality, the way they get there is merely by mating with a member of the opposite sex, uh, producing a bunch of offspring, which are the rest of the pack then, and uh, becoming the natural leaders that way, just like with a pair of humans producing a family. Instead of using the term alpha for a wolf, instead of saying alpha male or alpha female, uh, scientists now tend to call wolves like that the breeding male and the breeding female. And, um, or you can call them the mother wolf and the father wolf. There's really nothing wrong with that. Uh, those are much better and more accurate terms than the term alpha. Uh, actually, um, you know, I'm uh, very much to blame for the term alpha being used with wolves. Um, I published a book in 1970 that now has over 110,000 copies in circulation. And in that, I labeled the top 
uh, wolf in the pack, the alpha. And I did that because at that time, that's all that science knew. But uh, we've learned a lot. That, pub that book was published in 1970, and in the 35 years since that time, uh, we've learned an awful lot. One of the things we've learned is that the term alpha is really uh, incorrect when applied to most uh, wolf pack leaders. It's, a, it's appropriate to use the term alpha uh, in an artificial pack where, uh, you know, you might put many wolves um, from different assemblages together, unrelated wolves and that kind of thing. Then they would form a pecking order or, or a dominance hierarchy, and, and you could call the top animal at that point the alpha. But that, that rarely happens in the wild, if ever. And um, so, you know, that would be one case where you could use it. Another case is where you have a, what we call a um, complex pack or a multiple uh, or a pack with multiple breeders. Uh, in Yellowstone, for example, there have been some packs that have had as many as three breeding females. And in that case, you can call the, the top ranking female, who would usually be the mother, uh, you can call that animal the alpha female, but uh, you know, looked at in, a, in the perspective of uh, wolf packs in general around the world and all, uh, that rarely happens. Woo. Thanks, Dr. Meach. Okay. Um, so I want you to, now that you've seen that, take note of the fact that Dr. Meach is talking about wolves and wolf behavior. Um, obviously we do not have any, uh, adoptable wolves here at the shelter. So like, how does that even apply here? People have taken this theory about wolves and because dogs are descended from wolves way, way, way back in the day, they apply this theory to dogs as well. Um, but I think it's important to note that dogs are not wolves. They have been domesticated over centuries and millennia of breeding to become pretty much a separate entity altogether. I mean, they are a separate entity. Um, they've become more neotenous. Uh, they and humans have selectively bred dogs for specific traits and behaviors. Uh, so comparing the behavior of wolves to dogs is kind of an imperfect model. Like it works kind of, but it's an imperfect model. Um, so just keep that in mind. So great, but we all came here to talk about the dog whisperer, right? Because he's like the most popular dominance theory guy out there. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen episodes of the dog whisperer or clips or whatever and been like, Ugh, when we watch it, um, or maybe you like it. I don't know. It's up to you. Um, but let's just take a moment to talk about him. Um, so Caesar Milan, I guess, has 25 years experience training dogs. Although I don't actually know when that article was written, now that I think of it. We'll just say at least 25 years. How about that? Um, but he did help further dominance theory in popular culture by coaching dog owners to be calm, assertive leaders um, and establish themselves as the head of their pack. He also tells people that he's training, um, that dogs have three needs in life, exercise, leadership, and affection in exactly that order. Um, he often criticizes owners uh, because he says their dogs are not well behaved because they are losing their leadership position in the pack by being too affectionate with their dogs. Um, and of course, over the years, uh, Milan has been criticized by people in the behavior community for using this theory in 2007 and applied animal behavior science. Um, they stated his methods were outdated, flawed, and unscientific, and inhumane. Um, what Milan calls calm submission was found by professionals in dog behavior to be a state of helplessness resulting from fear and anxiety based on what he was doing. Um, I mean, Caesar Milan gets both praise and criticism for his methods. Some people love him, some people hate him. Those who praise him love the fact that he seems to get results so fast um, and like, if you're in a situation where you have an aggressive dog and you just need help now, his methods might appeal to you because, you know, results fast, according to TV. Um, those that criticize him tend to prefer to use more science-based, non-aversive training. Um, and since we are all here behavior nerds, let's bring this into dog training and behavior theory. Um, so dominance 
training techniques tend to rely on punitive training methods. Um, in Learning and Behavior by Paul Chance, which is a great book, you should read it, uh, he defined the four quadrants of consequences as positive reinforcement, a behavior that is strengthened, strengthened by the presentation of a stimulus that the animal wants, negative reinforcement, I'm sure I'm repeating this for all of you, you all know this, but um, negative reinforcement, a behavior is strengthened by the removal of an unpleasant stimulus that the animal wants to avoid. Positive punishment is presenting a unpleasant stimulus that causes a reduction in the strength of behavior and negative punishment, the removal of the stimulus that the animal seeks out, which causes a reduction in the strength of a behavior. So those are kind of the four, the four quadrants of consequences. If you have done any higher level BV classes, you will probably know these and it's already in your brain, but for anyone else, you hear us use these words, that would it mean, that's what it means. Like positive and negative reinforcement punishment, they don't have emotional connotations, it's just how it affects the behavior. Um, so as you can see, the term punishment refers to uh, taking a behavior you do not want and causing it to become less likely to occur. Like it's not about beating a dog, it's just taking a behavior and making it less likely to occur, basically. Um, so dominant theory basically is based on fixing problem behaviors and making them less likely to happen in the future. So as a contrast, the LEMA approach that we use adds friends for life, which stands for least invasive, minimally aversive, is more about using positive reinforcement, which is taking a behavior you do want and making it stronger. So you're giving the dog instructions on what you do want them to do so that they have an option to use in the future. And that's all pretty much dumbed down, but like, go with it. Um, so let's dive deeper into punishment in particular. Uh, punishment as a consequence is really hard to use correctly. Like if you're going to use it, make sure you do it right because it can have some consequences. If it's used improperly, like if you have poor timing, for example, is a huge thing. It can lead to fear, anxiety, distress, and an increase in aggression in dogs. Um, it's also often criticized as an inhumane method, though that's kind of simplifying things. I mean, I definitely have some opinions there, but like, it's simplified then. Um, if you are going to use punishment, it's important to have someone who really knows what they're doing do the training because otherwise you might have unintended consequences. Um, punishment as a training consequence teaches the dog that behaviors are unacceptable, but does not offer them an alternative to do instead. And it is also important to note that it is part of the humane hierarchy as a training technique. So like even those of us who follow Lima, it is on the humane hierarchy that we follow. See, it's right there, right next to the arrows. It is the last two steps. Um, basically what this means is you should try everything before you resort to punishment as a consequence if you are following the Lima training method which we do at Friends for Life. Please follow this. Um, so like it is on there as a thing you can do to, you know, fix whatever behavior you need to fix, but it's the very last step. So if you're resorting to that, maybe you haven't tried all the other things that you could try. So let's look at a case study in terms of using punishment for uh, training. Let's talk about our big boy, Julio. Um, because Julio was adopted from Friends for Life as a puppy. According to his Puppy K instructor, he was a super high energy puppy. I'm sure that shocks everyone who's ever met Julio. Um, his owners, on the advice that they were given by someone based on his high energy, brought him to a board and train facility that does use shock collars in their training. Um, like it was advised to them, they thought they were doing the right thing, so let's not judge them, but you know, it had some consequences. Um, this part is really important. The training facility that did Julio's training did not educate the owners on what to do when Julio was sent home. So like they went home with this dog and this shot collar and this button that they could press when they didn't like what he was doing, 
uh, but no clear instructions on like when to do it, how to do it, all that good stuff. Um, so they would pretty much just shock him indiscriminately. Like if he was jumping, he gets shocked. If he's running, he gets shocked. If he's barking, he gets shocked. Like if he's peeing outside. Yep, then he gets shocked. Um, so basically what this led to was that Julio learned that the only time he was guaranteed not to get a shock from the collar was when he was in his carrier or his crate or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's pretty much where he stayed. He went to the bathroom there, he ate there, he cowered there. That's pretty much all he knew because it was the only place he was safe. Um, when he was returned to Friends for Life, he was a super high energy jumper, like to the point where he has scarred people. Um, I think there's a long line of people waiting to get reimbursement for clothes that Julio has destroyed. Um, so like, that's that's kind of how he came back to us um because he was basically living in a crate during some really important developmental stages um also when he was returned to friends for life his name was actually brutus we had to change it um every like everything was just a trigger for him because he wasn't really sure what what would cause him not to get shocked. So like hearing his name was a trigger for him. Hearing us talk to him was a trigger. Touching him was a trigger. So like, which caused him to just kind of go out of control and jump up. And I'm sure there's uh, more subtlety to this story. I wasn't actually here for it. So I'm just kind of repeating someone else's words. Um, but basically there was a lot of uh, counter conditioning that was done so that he is the cute little boy he is today with impeccable manners, right? <laughs> He's still working on it. He's, he's cute. Um, so that's kind of a, an example of where using punishment as a consequence incorrectly can cause some long lasting damage in a dog's psyche. Hello. Uh, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, shall we? Because we've had this whole talk up to now um and i'm sure you're wondering when i'm going to get to the point where i'm like don't use dominance theory it's wrong punishment is wrong all of this is wrong don't be stupid i'm not going to say that um like honestly to each their own i have very uh definite opinions i'm happy to share them if anyone wants to ask i'm not shy about that um but like in terms of whether you're going to use dominant theory or whatever, it's up to you. I'm not going to tell you it's good or bad or whatever. Um, I personally, as a trainer, like to focus on what is more effective, like what's going to get me from point A to point B. Um, for me, punishment is not super effective because I don't know how to use it properly. Like my timing is not great. I'm not going to use this on a dog because I can do something that is not going to be great and I'm not going to get the results I want. Um, reinforcement, however, has a little more room for error, which very much appeals to me uh, because, you know, I have my off days, my timing isn't always great. Sometimes I screw things up. Um, if I'm doing that with positive reinforcement, I might get a comment from Melissa about my techniques. Um, but that's pretty much the worst that'll happen. It's not gonna cause any sort of emotional scarring on the dog um, that I will then have to counter condition, thus making more work for myself. I might just have to like flank around the office for a couple of days. Um, but it also, I like that reinforcement teaches the dog what is acceptable as opposed to what is not acceptable. Like I'm taking this behavior away as an option with punishment, but I'm not giving the dog something to replace it with. Whereas when I use positive reinforcement, I'm just saying, I don't like that behavior. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. But if you do this behavior, I like that a lot. Um, so I'm going to get more of the behavior I do like. Um, so again, it's, there's more room for error here because the dog actually gets some idea of what's in my head um, and there's actually some communication happening. Um, also, punishment can give results when used properly. Um, like if you if you have an extreme case of aggression and like you've tried literally everything under the sun and you're just not getting results 
and it's, you know, a matter of life and death to this dog, then if you go through a professional and they know what they're doing, that's up to you. Um, I am not ever going to be that professional. So I just prefer to stay away from it. Um, the only thing I will definitively say in terms of dominance theory and punishment and all that stuff is we do not use it at Friends for Life. We don't use punishment as a method of training. That's just our philosophy. That's how we train our volunteers and our staff. Um, so if you are handling dogs at this building, I can tell you unequivocally, you should not be using punishment. Um, what you do in your personal professional life is pretty much up to you. So let's go back to the dog whisperer, shall we? Um, I've got like a little two minute clip from the dog whisperer. It's kind of hard to watch, but bear with me. Um, so I wanna watch this video. And as you're watching it, take note of what you see in terms of what Caesar is communicating to the dog, what the dog is communicating to Caesar. Um, and then let's talk about how maybe we would handle it. Was this, was what Caesar did effective? Was it not effective? What would you do differently? All that good stuff. So keep that in the back of your mind because I am going to be calling on people. <laughs> Eventually, we're getting there. Internet, am I right? Out here, you're truly in your element. You an app. Where you grab hold and let nothing stand in your way. I <laughs> know, right? Yeah, so just before I play this clip, this is a resource guarding dog. Uh, he, she, I can't even see. I'm not, camera's not at a good angle. I think it's Holly though. Whatever, dog uh, does not like people coming up in her food. So that's kind of the gist of this. See, that's unsure, that's not submission. to give him a moment because the brain just got stuck this way yeah so just stay there she didn't do that to you earlier no not like that right <laughs> no no not at all okay no this is the first time i see this yeah yeah so you see just a relaxation it's 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 a it's yeah. a it's an understanding <laughs> That no, you didn't. Not yet, not yet. This is more water for me. I could see the aggression that he was showing to him. It's pretty bad. That aggression cannot be allowed around babies. This is gonna hurt right here, peroxide. No, no.
I was like about to faint right in front of her face. That's better. Open mouth. I gotta go get some ice. Ice, Christina. Ice. Caesar, I'm sorry. No worries, man. No, that's my job. Okay, just, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Is he okay? Oh, oh my he is gosh, fine. that was really he bad. He is fine. She needs major rehabilitation. Yeah. That's okay. That's why we're here. Why we're here, guys. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's take people off mute if you'd like and um, discuss. So, what did you guys see in terms of what the dog was telling? <laughs> It seems to me um, that Caesar is aggressive. They're calling the dog aggressive, but like his vibe is way too intense. That's kind of what I was thinking too, because Caesar was staring him directly in the eyes, which I thought we learned is a sign of aggression. Um, so maybe the dog was reacting to that. Um, but he didn't, the dog didn't, in my inexperienced opinion, the dog didn't look aggressive so much until the food was taken away. I mean, his ears were down and slightly back, but I mean, my dog looks a lot more aggressive than that on a normal basis. So, yeah, let's talk about like the behaviors we did see from the dog. Like, what what was that dog doing in terms of body language? I know Emery pointed out a couple things while we were watching. <laughs> so like me personally, I saw a lot of lip licking. I saw a lot of turning our head to the side. Those are like calming signals and distance increasing signals. Kind of telling him, I'm not comfortable, back off please. What did everyone else see? There was a way a lot at some point. I think it was before the dog bit Caesar. Mm -hmm. Yep, I saw the whale eye. And then all the while, while the dog was showing his, his teeth, um, all the fur in his back was raised. And yeah. I don't know, I don't know if it was just me, but the video was kind of choppy or was it in slow-mo? It was probably choppy, the internet is okay. not. Today. Maybe you can share it on the behavior page later so everyone can see it. Yeah. When it My internet more. was really bad too. I couldn't get a lot. You know what was really interesting for me was that they carry around like first aid stuff because we don't do that. Yeah. It's, it's, that's telling, I think. My favorite part was I didn't see that coming. I was shocked when I heard that. I was like, I saw that happen before it happened. <laughs> so I mean basically I showed you that to, to just kind of show because like obviously we're all used to the kind of training we do at the shelter so like you've all already drunk the Kool-Aid I don't really need to tell you about what we do at the shelter but this is just a contrast there are other methods out there that think this is effective um, and maybe it is for him it wouldn't be for me because like, dude, the first dog that bites me, I'm out. Uh, oops, hold on. There we go. Okay, so I have a quick question though. Yeah. So since I haven't had the dog BV stuff yet, so what do we do at the shelter? <laughs> um, it's a very- like in that specific scenario. There's a whole talk all about that. And if you go to our YouTube page, you can watch the resource. Then I there. will go watch that. Okay. But basically, I mean, we just teach the dogs to feel nice about when we approach them. So we have a couple dogs at the shelter who do guard things and, um, and we train them to expect something nice when we approach them, when they've got stuff. So, got so they, they feel good about it. And also they, learn incompatible behaviors to um, all that agonistic stuff that kind of fight uh, the fight signals, the defensive signals that she was showing. Yeah. Um, instead of that, you know, the dogs learn to move away from their food. Um, so, I mean, they feel good about it and they are doing something different from the problem behaviors. Got it. 
that makes a lot more sense. Like long story short, we wouldn't have that situation occur to have a reaction in. Um, but Melissa's right, there is an excellent talk on YouTube. Please watch it, it's amazing. Um, so you've heard me talk a lot about dogs. I tend to be a little more associated with cats. Um, and you're right, that's weird. And dominance theory does play into cats as well. How many of us have heard people say, oh, this is an alpha male, it's not gonna get along with my cats because it's too dominant, blah, blah, blah. Um, we often got cats returned from the PetSmart cattery or El Gato or you know, wherever our cats are um, because they weren't mixing well with the, the cat population there. And we were told by people that they were too alpha or too dominant to fit in well with the crowd that was there. Um, so we often found that that explanation didn't really address the root cause of the behaviors, you know, the dominant behaviors that the cat was displaying. Um, so like just saying a cat is dominant doesn't really help us figure out what's going on there because again, it's not a behavior, it is a relationship. Um, and the same concepts and pitfalls that you find with uh, dominant theory and dogs are present with cats. Um, and just like with dogs, it's important to think about what the cat is telling you and what you are telling the cat. So like for dogs, we have the humane hierarchy when we're trying to deal with an undesired proper, sorry, behavior. Um, and we kind of follow that and we address medical and emotional needs first and then we try to arrange antecedents so that they're not triggered to begin with and then we move on to positive reinforcement and blah 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 um so with cats we have the five pillars for a healthy feline environment and a lot of the time if you're having a problem behavior with a cat one of these pillars is not being addressed um and i think it's really important to point out that pillar number one is provide a safe place. If the cat does not feel safe, it's gonna, it's gonna display some behaviors that might be a little scary. Um, so those are the five pillars. I'm not gonna get like deep dive into that, uh, but we can at a later talk if you ever want to. So as a conclusion, and yes, I did end this early because I expect there to be a lot of discussion. So get questions ready. Um, but basically, just like anything in life, things exist in a spectrum. I'm not here to tell you that like one way of training is the right way or the wrong way. There are many different schools of thought out there. Um, I just urge you to educate yourself so that whatever you are doing, you're doing it the best you can. Uh, I certainly have opinions. I'm not shy about expressing them. If you ever want to know them, just get me, you know, give yourself like an hour and get me started and I will go to town. Um, but those are based on my own education and experience. And I would urge everyone to do their own research and get education and figure out what's best for them. Um, dominance theory, as far as the scientific community is concerned, is outdated. There have been studies and articles detailing more effective ways to deal with undesirable behaviors. And the theory itself was based on outdated research that has been revised and expanded upon since then. Um, most independent certifying boards for like dog trainers, so like the CCPDT that we're all certified through, uh, follow the Lima method as a training protocol. Um, it has been proven scientifically to have the best results and the fewest adverse consequences. There's plenty of studies out there, um, too many for me to list right here. Um, punishment, if done correctly, that's a huge caveat, can result in a better behaved animal like it might get rid of the behavior that you are not wanting that is kind of the whole concept of punishment is that behavior gets weaker and goes away um but if it's done incorrectly it can result in more and more serious problems and animals are complex organisms stay flexible with your training like there is no right way to do things i think it's more important to be flexible with with your state of mind um and I think it's also important to note that a person can be an effective leader without having to exert any overt dominance. Like, I mean, Evelyn isn't here in the shelter every day whipping us to get performance out of us. 
Um, so you can be a, a leader without being dominant. Um, animal ownership inherently leads to humans being the more dominant partner because like, I don't know about you, but my dogs have not grown opposable thumbs. They cannot get to the important resources that they need to sustain their life because their food is in a bin in the pantry. So I control their food. They have to get it from me. Um, so that kind of automatically makes me the more dominant partner in the relationship. But I maintain communication with my dogs and provide them with clear feedback and predictable ways about how they can earn their food. So if they exist in the kitchen at 6 a.m., they can get food. Because um, at 6 a.m., I ain't doing any training, sorry. Um, so like, I can still lead them and provide them with the resources they need um, and basically be the gateway to those resources without having to alpha roll them every time I give them breakfast. So thank you for listening to me ramble. Uh, I think it would be a great time to open the floor up for questions, comments, and personal experiences. I actually do have a personal experience with uh, dominance training. I hired trainers back in the day that were dominance trainers. So if you'd like me to share that, I'm happy to. Um, but while we do discuss and ask questions, I would ask that everyone keep an open mind and remember that behavior and training is a constantly evolving field. As we get more research and more scientific studies and all that good stuff, we learn about how animals think and about how we impact our relationships with them and we update our theories and practices. Like 50 years ago, dominant theory was the best, most effective thing out there because there had been studies been done and that was what science was telling us we should do. So please don't judge anyone for speaking of their past experiences. This is a safe place. And I think it's important to have, you know, an open discourse. So go ahead and take yourselves off mute and let's get to the questions or the comments or the whatever. Thank you, Beth. I really uh, think that this would be a great talk to do, uh, to open up to the public and maybe just make it a little bit more detailed, you know, a little bit longer so that you can kind of open up some of the terminology that you use to people who maybe haven't had as much um, behavior geeking experience as we have. It's true. But, it's true. Um, I think it's a wonderful topic that needs to be talked about. Uh, maybe it just shows my age uh, because I've been doing this for a while and I did start out uh, as a trainer who did read the Monks of New Skeet, you know, as a child. It's one of my f first training books. And I also had a book um, that was published by the Updike Publishing Company. I don't remember what it was called, but it did say to like, I mean, there were a lot of uh, elements of dominance training in that book, um, including things like starving your dog for <clears throat> 36 hours prior to training them so that there was that, um, you know, they were hungry and, you know, ready to train for food. And I had that, in a, uh, the monks of New Skeets uh, were uh, dog breeders. Some of you probably know of them because they're pretty, their book was really, really famous. Um, and they're um, breeders of German Shepherds up in New York, upstate New York, and dog trainers. And um, they, you know, they did the alpha roll and they also recommended, oh, here comes my son. He's about to <laughs> ask me a question. But, um, and also like squeezing the dog's nose until the dog fried out was one, one of them. One of the things was like, I mean, this isn't, you know, it's not obviously cruel, but I wouldn't recommend it. They recommended that people drive with their cars with the dog's leash, like, you know, in tow to like make the dogs run to get, give the dogs enough exercise, which I thought was really weird, dangerous. And I mean, lots of stuff and, and pictures of like, it was weird because they're monks, so they're very religious. So they were like religious looking pictures, like from stained glass, like church windows, um, illustrations in their books of like people holding dogs down and doing horrible, like doing really um, physical things to dogs. Um, but at the time, you know, I didn't, um, you know, I, I would say that I loved my dogs just as much back then. Um, 
but I was really, you know, lucky to have started at the ASPCA Animal Behavior Center in, in my internship. Um, and, um, and they made me feel really safe about transitioning. Like I didn't even think that they were talking to me. Like I never talked to them about my experience as a, as like a force trainer. Um, and I didn't consider myself a force trainer. Like force trainers don't think, oh, I'm a force trainer. You know, like we call them that because, you know, we're force free, right? Or we're, um, you know, we use relatively little force. Anyway, to me, so I, I modeled Friends for Life's behavior program um, in this way because um, I had learned from my experience that the dominance related training was not effective, be, not because of, you know, any type of methods that that dominance um, theory trainers use, but because you really, e even though you can try to explain behaviors using dominance, it really doesn't ever break down the nuts and bolts of behavior the way that like the science of learning theory does, which is such a science that you actually, you know, you learn it in Psych 101. If you can remember back when you were in college, you probably learned about operant and classical conditioning, and you probably learned about positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. You know, they don't teach you about like dominance theory in college, do you? Because it's, you know, it doesn't, it, you can't really use it to explain a lot of stuff. So, um, so even, so if we taught dominance theory at the shelter, it wouldn't help us really solve problems, especially exotic problems. Like if I saw something that I'd never seen before, dominance theory wouldn't give me the opportunity to break it down to figure out, you know, what the antecedent of the behavior is. What what is the trigger, and how is what is fueling this behavior? Um, so anyway, I could go on and on, just like Beth. Actually, I shouldn't get started about it, but it's not very it's not very efficient. Like dominance theory in and of itself is not punitive. You know, like there are lots of punitive, like a lots of force uh, dominance theory trainers. There are also lots of dominance theory trainers that are relatively force free. But what it comes down to is they're using kind of a false narrative to explain behaviors. And you know, we want to be truthful to caregivers. We don't want to make up a story about what we think is going on in the brain of the animal. Okay, I'll be sh I'll shut up. That's all I had to say. Anyone else have comments or questions or experiences they want to share? Um, I will just say that I, I think that's probably the most important thing for me is to recognize that um, dominance theory is outdated because I only took my first um, obedience type class, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. And, um, and that's really the only training I had before I started volunteering for Friends for Life. And uh, I never thought about whether or not this person doing the training, um, you know, because they had been on TV you know, so in my mind, well, they're the experts, so they know, and it never occurred to me that maybe they're not teaching the right, you know, methods or the best methods just because they've been on this TV show. And, um, and then also it never, I don't know why, because it should have occurred to me that things do change, that we do know more as um, time goes on. So for me, that's a big message. And anyway, I'm really glad y'all are doing these classes, I've been trying to soak up as much as I can. Awesome. We're glad you're here. Anyone else? I mean, I'll just throw it out here that basically my, what was it, 13 years ago now, I hired some dog trainers because I had what I was told was an aggressive dog. Um, kind of wish I could rewind time because I would do a lot of things very differently, but it is what it is. Um, but I hired some trainers because they came really highly recommended to me. Like everyone I asked was like, oh my God, use these guys. They're amazing. They had a lifetime guarantee. You pay like one fee and then you get lifetime training. And I was like, I mean, you can't beat that deal. 
Um, so I hired them. They were called Bark Busters. Um, and basically in like the first session, my dog, they had like, they brought like little six inch lengths of chain that you were supposed to throw on the ground near the dog. They said it mimicked growling or a dog biting or something, although I never really saw it. So whatever. Um, anytime they did anything that you didn't want them to do to kind of stop the behavior. Uh, we went on a walk with my dog because she was super reactive and like I couldn't walk her around my apartment complex without her going off at like people or dogs or whatever. Um, and basically a block away from my apartment, she melted down, laid down on the sidewalk, tail tucked, shaking, licking her lips, whale eyes, the whole nine yards, which I had no idea what the heck that meant at that time. Um, and I was like, oh my God, she's so stressed out. What's happening to my dog? And the trainers were like, oh good. She's melting down. That's a great sign. And I was like, oh, what? Cause like, it didn't look good to me, but the professionals were telling me it was good. So I was like, yay, I have a dog pedal. How am I supposed to get this back home though? Um, so like, that was my first professional dog training experience was, was that advice and that technique. And I wish I had to do it over again. Cause I could probably help that dog a little more, but it is what it is. Anyhow. I had a similar experience with, with a dog I had as a teenager that I was like, he had some stranger issues. Um, but I mean, you know, it was very rare and he didn't like this one guy, but the guy fancied has himself to be a dog trainer. And he's like, I know exactly what you need to do. You've got to show that you're the leader. And I'm 17. I didn't know any better. I'm like in a park in Manhattan, um, he was just one of my neighbors. Like it wasn't like a stranger. I, it was a neighbor. And, um, and so he was like, let me show you. And I, he took, like, I gave him my dog's leash, like so stupid. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what made me do that. And he took the, um, and my dog wasn't doing anything at the time, minding his own business. And he took the handle of my leash and whipped him with it. <laughs> I know. And my dog tried to bite him and I was like, Oh no, thanks. I, did, I took it back. And I was like, wow. So what did that just do to him? You know, that wasn't, you know, I, the thing, that's the thing is when people think about showing animals that you're the leader, what are they thinking of doing? That's the other thing about dominance training is like, what do you mean by dominance? And what do you mean by the fact that you're the alpha? Does it mean that you're going to like whip animals, <laughs> you know, like it, what does it mean? And to that guy, that meant that he was, you know, going to uh, put some fear of physical harm into my dog. Yeah. Well, it is, I guess, three o'clock. So anyone else have any comments? Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, then I guess we can wrap it up. I'll put this up on YouTube as well as a link to the Caesar Milan video so you can actually watch it. I just want to, like, there on the chat, there was a question from Camille about, you know, what quadrant shock collar, using a shock collar was. And classic me, I had to ask a whole bunch of questions before I can answer that question. <laughs> So, um, so I'm ask, I'm not, when I ask those questions, it's not because I'm trying to be, um, difficult. It's because a shock collar isn't a quadrant, like a shock collar by itself isn't positive punishment, positive reinforcement, negative punishment or negative reinforcement. What really matters is what are you doing? You know, what are you doing, you know? and when, what's the contingency factor behind what you're doing? So, um, um, Selena asked a simple question is what is a secondary reinforcer? So a reinforcer is like more or less something that makes a behavior happen more often. So, and a secondary reinforcer is something like when we say yes 
because we say yes before we give a dog food or like some people will use like a clicker before they give a dog food or a cat. So that's secondary reinforcer. And I was explaining that I have seen shock collars used as secondary reinforcers. Like they buzz the dog and they give a dog a treat and the dog is so like, uh, so uh, adapted to the shock of the collar that that it's meaningful to them as a secondary reinforcer. So, I mean, in that way, you could use a shock collar theoretically as a positive reinforcer. Would I do that? Never. But I mean, that's possible. So, Camille, the answer to your question is go to BV3 because, <laughs> because that's like, you know, we spend a good like, week or two on that. <laughs> I just need to do the ethograms and then wait for the training and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the training is like, that's, BB3 is the training. It's like seven meetings. So, uh, okay. Okay, so hopefully we'll see you at BB3, Camille. <laughs> I, I just need to do the ethograms and then that's, that's the only barrier keeping me from going to BB3. <laughs> Do it. I know you have a lot of videos. I know. I'll, hopefully I'll be able to do all of them before the weekend or until. I'll, I'll, I'm giving myself that deadline because I've been putting this off since last year. Yeah, do it. Uh, Emily wants to know when the next BBG training is. So um, for you guys, for Emily, Emily's group, um, I just have to coordinate because a lot of people want to do it and they couldn't all go at the same time. That's probably the hardest thing about doing the training. I'm going to have to split it up into a couple groups. So just keep an eye out. That's still in the works. And then for everybody else who wants to do BB2, that's um, once every two months. We do dog BB2 and Beth, did you schedule the next cat BB2? Uh, not yet. I'm still trying to get through the third part of the current one. But I will definitely be scheduling one not too long after that. And um, and then I don't remember now who asked about like how we would do the resource guarding. Was that Michelle? Okay. Um, then we could just like post the link to that video. I'll post the link to the video on the um, on the group or I'll just tag you in it. It might be already there. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting talk. Yeah, and it stars our very own Chancer. Fancy pants. That's you. It's so funny because, you know, everybody was so worried about his resource guarding, but when he went home with, he's been, he's been home with like a, a foster and he's been home with an adopter since we've done that training and they didn't even see any of that. Nice. So good. Effective. Good stuff. All right, guys. Well, thank you again, Beth. Uh, 